Good morning. My name is Jim Jones. I'm the chairman of the board of the Pro Bono Institute, and I want to welcome you to our opening plenary session. Uh, I should note that I am uh, standing in this morning for Esther Lardent. Uh, as many of you know, Esther uh, continues to recover from some health issues she's had over the past year, and uh, notwithstanding her intent uh, views to the contrary, uh, many of us felt that particularly given conditions outside today, this was not a good day for Esther to be venturing out. So uh, we are carrying on in her absence and uh, we'll try to do her proud. Um, so with that, let me say that our opening plenary is going to be divided into two parts um, that are really not terribly related except they're both about pro bono and social justice. Uh, the first part, uh, we have, uh, we're very pleased to have a very distinguished speaker with us uh, who will be introduced in just a moment and with whom we will have a conversation about uh, pro bono work and particularly in the context of, of a large law firm. And I think you'll find uh, some of what he has to say quite interesting. Um, I also want to say that the second part will be a, um, a look at the notion of collective impact, which is a topic that I know all of you and many of you have, have given a lot of thought to. We have uh, two people who will be uh, talking about that. First of all, uh, Mark Kramer from FSG. His, his firm has been one of the leading advocates of the concept of collective impact uh, in, as an approach to social justice and charitable giving. And, and uh, talking with him about that will be Jim Volman, Voling from uh, Fagery. So with that, uh, let me invite Paul Smith uh, from Jenner and Block to please come up and introduce our special guest, Paul. Thanks, Jim, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my honor and, of course, my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, the Solicitor General of the United States, Donald B. Verrilli. I think we should all be honored that Don found his way here, not just on a snowy day, but the day after his argument in the hugely important Afford Affordable Care Act case. I hope you got some sleep last night, Don. Uh, Don attended Yale College and Columbia Law School, where he was editor-in-chief of the Law Review. He clerked for Skelly Wright and for Justice Brennan on the Supreme Court. Since then, he's become one of the most stellar appellate advocates in this town, culminating, of course, in his service as the Solicitor General. Long before that public service began, though, Don never lost sight of the duty to serve the public interest as a private practitioner, and I think that's what he's going to be talking to you about today. We were partners at Jenner and Block for about 15 years, and during that time, Don did some of the most important pro bono cases that were done in uh, Washington, focusing on the death penalty, among many other issues. So it's fitting, I think, that he's leading off this conference. And without further ado, I give you Don Verrilli. Don, Hi, thank you. Don, thank you very much for being with us this morning. Uh, we appreciate your coming out and taking time from your busy schedule. And, particularly on a uh, snowy day. Hey, so, the government's closed, so. Yeah, the government's <laughs> closed, that's right, but the Solicitor Generals never are never <laughs> closed, right? Um, what we wanted to do was just chat for a few minutes about pro bono and your long record of pro bono service, as Paul mentioned. Uh, and I, I promise that uh, the questions will be less hostile than some that you probably <laughs> had to field yesterday, but... Uh, uh, bring it on. Right. <laughs> bring it on. You're yeah. ready. But we don't have a little red light, so, <laughs> so you, know, you can take as much time as you like. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think many people in this room know, uh, as Paul alluded to, um, that you yourself, uh, throughout your career, have had a very strong commitment to Bromono. I mean, literally investing hundreds and sometimes thousands of hours in, uh, in pro bono cases. Um, and I wonder, uh, at, at the same time, you were obviously a very successful uh, uh, commercial litigator um, in a very busy and successful law firm. So uh, as, as others look at your career and say, gee, how can you manage to blend both significant pro bono service with a very successful commercial career. I wonder if you have thoughts you'd like to share with us about that. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, first of all, I guess what I would say is not that hard. Uh, really, <laughs> get right down to it. And I had, uh, during my uh, 
time at Jenner and Block, I set for myself a goal that each year I would try to spend at least 10% of my hours on pro bono matters. And I think there's maybe one year I didn't do it, but I, most of every year I was there, I, I was able to do that. And I think far from being uh, a, a detriment to my ability to uh, have a successful uh, commercial corporate practice, I actually thought it made a huge positive difference in my ability to do it because it was largely through my pro bono work, especially as a younger lawyer, that I really, I think, learned a lot of the key lessons about how to be a good lawyer. And you know, in particular, when I think back on, on some of the early death penalty cases I did, I started as soon as I was in private practice picking up these habeas cases. And they were my cases. You know, I was the lawyer on them. And so I would have to go down to uh, Columbus, Georgia, or Gulfport, Mississippi, mm -hmm. or wherever it was, and do the investigation in a not always friendly environment, and go into the local uh, county courthouses and make my arguments. And uh, I, you know, I learned a huge amount about, uh, about judgment uh, in that process, and you know, mm -hmm. thinking of, and, and taking responsibility and making judgments about what kinds of arguments to go with and what kinds of arguments not to go with. So I really felt like a lot of my um, ability to be a, a good lawyer was forged in that practice in a way that just wouldn't have been true, I think, as a young associate uh, uh, on the, the major matters of the firm. Hmm. Um. You mentioned your work on death penalty cases. You, you certainly were well known for working on a lot of sort of hot button issues, if I, if I may call them that. Um, I wonder if you have found any of that work on those controversial issues to be any kind of, of barrier in terms of your, your public service now. Uh, you know, again, I think the opposite. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, and. Um, I, t I talk about this when I see young people now and speak in uh, at law schools or whatever. That I, you know, I think back in the 1980s when I started, if you uh, said to yourself, as I did not, uh, you know, I'd like to be the Solicitor General someday, or I'd like to be a judge someday, probably the last thing you would do would be then go out and seek pro bono death penalty cases because mm -hmm. you know they're somewhat, I suppose, controversial now. They were extremely controversial back in the 1980s and 90s. And um, yet, I can you know, sitting here say to a moral certainty that had I not done that work back then, and I not taken on those cases, I would not have this job right now. And that is in part because, as it turned out, in a, on five of the cases, uh, five times, I ended up in the Supreme Court arguing on behalf of somebody on death row. So a huge amount of my actual Supreme Court argument experience before getting this job came out of doing that work. But as I said, more importantly, I just, I just was a way that I learned how to become a good lawyer doing that work. So I really feel like um, <clears throat> it's quite important for young lawyers to understand that it's just a bad idea to shy away from controversy in that um, you know, you going through that process of taking on an unpopular client or an unpopular cause, in a lot of ways, that's what being a lawyer is all about. And it actually helps you understand what the nature of an attorney-client relationship is, and it makes you understand how you're supposed to fight for your client, and that obviously applies to all of your clients. So, you know, I, I, as I said, I really thought that it was a huge positive, not a negative. Yeah, interesting. I, I want to ask you, because you come, out of, you come out of a firm, Jenner & Block, that um, has a long and distinguished history of pro bono service, um, really, really enviable in many ways. And yet, if, if I look at your firm uh, as compared to most of the other large firms represented in this room, uh, you have very little infrastructure, formal infrastructure in place to support a pro bono program. I, I don't think you have any any full-time people who are devoted to supporting pro bono. And so I wonder, what is it about the culture or the DNA of Jenner that has produced this, these extraordinary results? So I, I haven't been there for about six and a half years now, so I, I, can't, can't, not, you know, I, I can't speak in... Well, Paul, Paul has I, been I nodding while I was saying that. So. But, but, but what you just described uh, uh, certainly accurately captures the Jenner and Block that I know uh, from mm -hmm. my 20 years there. And, uh, you know, uh, 
I can't tell you how the culture came to be because it was quite well established by the time I got there in the 1980s, uh, but I can tell you some of the markers of it. Um, and one, one marker, I think, is uh, quite, quite important, is that the leaders of the firm, the, you know, the very top uh, leaders of the firm, took on significant pro bono work themselves and argued significant pro bono appeals and uh, encouraged their younger lawyers to do significant pro bono work. In Chicago, in the firm's main office, there was a huge amount of criminal work. And Jerry Solovey, who was a great leader of Jenner and Block and for many years the chairman of the firm, you know, he was constantly doing hundreds of hours of pro bono work every year when he was chairman of the firm and managing a you know, $20, $30 million practice, $40 million practice, whatever it was. He was also doing literally hundreds of hours of pro bono work and arguing pro bono cases himself and supervising uh, younger lawyers doing pro bono arguments in the Seventh Circuit. And so, and you know, Tony Belucas, the same thing. And of course, Paul has been a, 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 a extraordinary stalwart in, uh, in setting that kind of example for the next generation at Jenner and Block as the leader of the firm about how important it is. And so I think that's, you know, that's a huge, that's a huge part of what made it work at Jenner and Block without much infrastructure was that you looked around and you saw that the, pe the people who ran the firm believed in this. And they showed they believed in it by what they did. It wasn't by, you know, talking a good game, uh, but was, they, sh they showed it by what they did, and I think that made a huge difference. So it was really the definition of what being a good lawyer was all about became that yeah, as well. Yeah, if you as, wanted to be, yeah. you know, if you wanted to follow in the footsteps of Jerry Salvi or Tony right. Lucas or Paul Smith, you know, you were going to be doing a lot of pro bono work, including on very controversial matters. You know, they, the, the, the firm back in the 60s handled, handled the Witherspoon case, you know, the challenge to uh, death qualified uh, uh, juries and really quite, quite important landmark case and the leaders of the firm, you know, Bert Jenner himself and Jerry Solomon and others worked on that case, handled that case. So, uh, it, you know, I do think that, that that kind of setting of an example is just hugely important. Mm -hmm. So what, what was your most memorable pro bono engagement? So it's probably a case uh, uh, called uh, Wiggins uh, was a death penalty case uh, coming out of Maryland. And uh, back in the early 1990s, maybe 93, 92, 93, I guess, uh, I got a, a call from a lawyer here in town um, named Russ Cannon, who did some death penalty work, saying, I've got a death penalty case in Maryland. It's just entering state habeas. Would you co-counsel with me? And I said, sure, happy to. And then about three weeks later, Russ got nominated to be a judge. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I was on my own in that case, and from there on out. And we did the state habeas uh, work in the 90s and uh, <clears throat> had a you know, like two-week trial and weren't successful, went through the state system, then went into federal habeas and actually uh, got uh, relief from the federal district court in, in Baltimore, both the sentence and the actual conviction thrown out sentence on ineffective assistance of counsel grounds and the conviction on insufficient evidence grounds. Uh, went to the Fourth Circuit, got it reversed, uh, <coughs> lost in the Fourth Circuit, and then the uh, Supreme Court took cert. And this was about a 10-year saga. It was a, a case ended up being argued in March of 2003, and uh, it was quite a remarkable thing. I don't know, I'm not sure exactly to this day why of all the ineffective assistance of counsel cases that the Supreme Court uh, sees in the cert stage why they plucked this one out, but they did, and uh, it ended up being uh, quite a significant matter, and the court uh, ruled actually seven to two in our favor that the lawyer had received ineffective assistance of counsel, that the client had received ineffective assistance of counsel because the lawyer had not done the necessary investigating, the necessary investigatory work to make informed judgments about what the trial tactics ought to be, and it was a case in which the uh, client didn't have a criminal history apart from the crime uh, that he was accused of and had had just an unbelievably agonizing and uh, brutal childhood that it's really hard to imagine somebody could have lived through, but he did. 
uh, and none of, none of which had been brought out, none of which had really been discovered and brought out, much less uh, presented to the, to the court at the time of his uh, sentencing. And so that, you know, that was really quite, a, quite an odyssey for me to carry that case for 10 years and have it actually go from you know, the county court in Baltimore County, Maryland, all, all the way to the Supreme Court and actually get a, a victory in which uh, even Chief Justice Rehnquist joined the opinion, which well. is really quite amazing. <laughs> well, you know, that that yeah. is a mark. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned um, <clears throat> previously that um, when you were in private practice, that your goal was always to, to have at least 10% of your time every year going to pro bono work. Um, I mean, some people in major law firms would say, well, great, with 10% of what? So, you know, it's, a, it's yeah, always a little there. That, yeah. Right? yeah. But, um, but I wonder, uh, and, and in, in a number of speeches, you, you've advocated that that ought to be the norm for all lawyers. Um, the, uh, the pro bono challenge, which uh, has, has been out there for, goodness, going on almost 20 years now, uh, suggests that firms designate either 3 or 5% of their total time for pro bono. And in fact, uh, most of the firms that are challenge members uh, manage to achieve that. Some exceed it. Uh, but for a number of firms, it's a stretch. Um, and I wonder, particularly given the, uh, the current you know, market realities of the, uh, of, the, of the legal services market today, if you think that that 10% goal really is a realistic goal that firms as a whole can achieve or aspire to, and uh, you know yeah. what your thoughts are. Well, so about first, that. I would say you know the, I think the challenge goals are are very important and they're worthy goals, and the firm's commitments to to those goals and carrying out those commitments are really important and it makes a huge difference. But I guess what I would say about this is it comes from I think from now being out of the law firm world for mm -hmm. six plus years and looking at it from the outside and looking at it uh, at a, at a, at a, from the perspective of what we've gone through as a country for the last six years in terms of uh, the, the economic calamity that we faced in 2008 and on the way we've tried to claw back from that as a country. And the, you know, the way it looks to me uh, now from the outside is that we are living in a nation in which the gap between the wealthy and everybody else just keeps growing wider and wider, and uh, and you know income inequality and wealth inequality be is becoming a more and more serious problem. And it and it's all it's true in the economy generally. It's true in the country generally. It's also true in the legal profession, you know. And I just think that's a reality that all of us in this profession should face up to. That you know there are these very real market pressures. I get that, but. It's, you know, it's not just that the poor uh, can't afford basic legal services anymore, it's that the middle class can't afford basic legal services anymore. And um, although you know, law firms have gone through uh, some tough economic times over the last six years, I realize that, uh, you know, again, now that I'm out of the world and I have a little perspective on it, you know, actually law firms are doing unbelievably well. And partners in law firms, and the major law firms in this country, make a huge amount of money. And so I guess my sense of it is that um, it, uh, because this has always been a public profession, and we've always defined ourselves as having a public mission as lawyers, uh, that uh, given the, the state of our economic uh, situation now, uh, and given the fact that law firms really are doing very well and there is a crying need for the middle class as well as the poor, that whether, you know, maybe 10% is an unrealistic goal, I don't know, um, but I do think it's something that we should aspire to. Uh, and, you know, as I said, for myself, I did it like every year and it wasn't all that hard really. And um, and it was incredibly enriching at the same time for me in terms of my experience. And um, so I guess in terms of a norm, I think, it, I think this is a profession ought to give some thought to whether you know, this is a norm that can express our commitment to the public. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And it's one in which I do think, you know, with a little perspective, you realize actually, you know, yeah, law firms can't afford this economically because law firms, you know, people who work in law firms do exceedingly well economically as compared to everybody else uh, mm -hmm. in the country. And so, anyway, that's, that's just me talking, right? That's yeah. me personally. It's not a government view of any kind. <laughs> it's just my, my own personal sense of things, and it does come Although out I'm sure the government is in own. favor of access to justice. And, and, and uh, very much so, but, but I'm not speaking really government. This is just my own right. personal take on you know, thinking about pro bono, you know, both based on my own experience and now, as I said, having some little more of an outside perspective on the situation yeah. than I did. But. Having, having said all that, personally, would you, uh, what, what would you think of mandatory pro bono? So, you know, I've never given that any thought. Jim, actually, I've never yeah. given that any thought. Um, but I guess what I, you know, my sense of that, watching uh, the, the place like Jenner and Block work as successfully as it did to just have a culture in which it was, you know, was part of what it meant to be a lawyer at this mm -hmm. firm was to do this. That that's where we want to get to, you know, that this is part of what it means to be a lawyer, to do this, period. You know, that's what, a, that's what lawyers do. You know, they serve their clients, and part of serving their clients is taking on clients who need pro bono assistance, and that's right. just what you do. You know, that's, I think, that to me seems like the goal. Right. I, you know, you, you make a very important point, and, and uh, I think a lot of people have observed that, um, notwithstanding the fact that over the last couple of decades particularly, um, you know, law firms, like all the law firms in this room, have, have devoted huge resources to pro bono. I, I think... Last year, uh, you know, the pro bono signature firms had something like 4.3 million hours of pro bono time. I mean, that's a lot. Um, and yet, um, if you look at the overall situation of access to justice in our country, we haven't moved the needle very much. You know, I mean, it would be a lot worse off if we hadn't done the 4.3 million hours. I mean, I don't mean that. But we, in terms of the overall society, we haven't moved the needle that much. And so... I wonder uh, if you have, uh, apart from the, you know, the sort of the 10% commitment, if there are other things that you think that prominent lawyers, lawyers in prominent law firms, could or should be doing to, to more effectively address this problem of access to justice? Because I think you put your finger on it. I mean, it's, it's not just access to justice for the poor, it's access to justice for the middle class. Uh, I mean, we have, a, we have a justice system that's increasingly so expensive that people just can't afford it. Yeah, so in addition to the, the volunteering of pro bono time, which, which as you said, I mean, it has moved the needle some. It's, it's hugely important. And imagine what the world would be like if you didn't have those four right, point some right. odd million hours. You know, I do think, and this is, this, I'm not an expert on this, and there's some great people <laughs> working uh, in the Justice Department and in the White House and, uh, and in... Uh, think tanks and organizations around the country trying to think these things through and they've got ideas that are very well developed and, and uh, that they're aggressively pursuing. But I just think at the, at the 30,000 foot level, I think we need to recognize that this is, it's going to take a, a very, very significant commitment of resources and those resources are going to have to be both public resources and private resources and they're going to have, it's going to have to be federal resources and state and local resources and so I guess you know in addition to trying to set the standard uh, uh, themselves that put let raise uh, you know set the bar high within law firms that it's important for leaders of the profession to continue as they as they do now but to continue uh, in a very aggress aggressive pursuit at both the state and local and national level of commitment to the funding necessary for access to justice because you know, it, that, that there is a crying, crying need there just to meet the basic, the basic legal needs of middle class Americans. Uh, there's a crying need there uh, as well as not to mention the poor uh, who keep getting left further behind. Um, and so I do think in addition to pro bono, that kind of recognition that this is an important public policy objective that we ought to be devoting ourselves to. Great. Don, thank you very oh, much. It was my we pleasure. We really appreciate my your pleasure. being with us. Great time. to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff.